Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, yo, Dad, what's up? What's going on? What's going on? How's your week been? Um, it's been pretty good. I'm I'm back to work now, back okay. collecting this data. Okay. Uh so, you know, trying to get my rest in, get my exercise in, but you know, also be really productive. Um, I'm actually in another step competition, remember? I oh. think a little <laughs> and they they don't want to let me win first place, man. I, I really need this first place. I need a win this week. So You got I'm, good teammates this time? Is it like with teams or is it by or, No, this time is not with teams. It's oh, okay. individual. So I'm just fighting for myself this time. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can win first place. That'll be my win for the week. I wonder if people like, if you put it like, because it's like a Fitbit, what are you using? Is it? I use a Fitbit. I wonder, so I wonder if somebody just like, put it on their dog and like just let their dog walk around in the backyard all day or stuff like that and get all these extra steps. In. That's so funny. That was actually a joke that somebody, cause I was in a competition last week too. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody said that because the first place person was just like way ahead of everybody else. And they were joking. I, I know it was a joke. There are ways to cheat. I personally don't because it's like, I mean, I'm doing it for the physical activity. And of course I want to be competitive and win, but I don't win anything by like just moving my arm around. But cause yeah, cause once I, when I did my oral comprehensive exam, like I went in probably with like 2000 steps. And because I was talking with my hands so much, I, I left my comprehensive <laughs> exam with like 7,000 steps. I'm like, yo, I have not walked 5,000 steps. So uh, you do a lot of walking in that presentation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I was sitting down the whole time just talking with my hands. So there are ways I don't do it. Now, I will dance around my living room or walk around the house, but that's still actual steps. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, me and Kristen just got Fitbits. And so I didn't set mine up yet. She set hers up. And so she'd be, she be using it all the time, telling me her heart rate every five seconds. Yeah. So y'all need to friend me. Y'all need to friend so I got to, I got to, yeah, I got to set it up and start getting my steps in and seeing what that look like. Yeah. Trying to, trying to be healthy. Trying to be healthy. <laughs> yeah. What's been up with you? Not in the same old, same old teaching and just trying to, you know, stay afloat. Everything's been good. You know, really just trying to now, uh, I'm at the point now where I'm a couple years away from tenure. Uh oh. Oh, God. So, <laughs> so I've been really trying to, um, these next couple of years now, you know, I got my teaching out the way first couple of years and I got my service out the way these last couple of years. And now these next two is nothing really, but going to be really just about research and getting some, getting some pubs out. Get them so publications been, out. Yeah. Yeah. So I've just been focusing on that, figuring out what I'm about to write about and getting some things ready to, okay. to, to mark up. But yeah, you know, nothing super exciting for the most <laughs> part. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do we have on the. Today's uh, topic. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even think of the word I wanted to say. What's up for today? <laughs> uh, today, um, as you know, we haven't done it in a while because, you know, we had the holiday break. And then this month, we just started getting back to the flow of things. So it was like our listener guest episode. We'll be bringing in either a friend of ours or a listener of the show, whomever, to come chat with us about pretty much current events that's been going on for this past month. And, of course, things that they like to talk about, too. Um, so who we have on today's episode is Reverend Daryl Paul Levon. Mm. And you may be familiar with that last name. Yes, this is Dr. Siobhan Morlebon's husband that was on last week talking about anxiety and is our new resident psychologist. And now I guess maybe uh, Daryl will be our resident reverend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They are black love couple goals. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They out here doing it. Mm-hmm. Making the change in the community and making moves and, and coming to chat with us all on BHD. So we definitely appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so this cover, so of course we're not doing Old Lord News, which is the norm because pretty much this entire episode will be full of Old Lord News and current events and all that stuff. So we'll talk about things like religion, politics, and a lot of other things that's been going on, you know, with maybe some empire actors potentially. Oh, but we'll, we'll, you guys will hear our viewpoints on that <laughs> in the episode. But uh, I guess without further ado, we can get into it. Yep, Catch up with y'all get later. Started. All right. 
Today we have a very special guest, the Reverend Daryl Paul Laban, Director of Communications with the Episcopal Diocese of Washington and fellow at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute. Did I get it right, Daryl? You got it correct. <laughs> Welcome, man. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you uh, and to not only continue a conversation that we started last year, you know, about the black church and religion in the black community, but also talk a little politics and current events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really exciting. So, yeah, this episode for all of you who have who may be new to the podcast, you know, um, pretty much once a month, we try to get on somebody with us, somebody who we know or somebody who's been listening to the podcast. Come on, talk a little bit about their expertise area, what they know, share some of that knowledge. And then we get into some current events and hot topics that pretty much have been going on this past month and dive into it a little deeper. Since we usually don't get the chance to do that with our other interview episodes. So this is an opportunity to do so. So we're glad to have Daryl to come on and to come chat with us a little bit about about all this good stuff. Um, so we get started the way we typically start, Daryl. Um, you know, just introduce yourself to our audience and let them know who you are and kind of what you do. Uh, sure. Well, thank you again for having me on this podcast. So my name is Daryl LeBon. I am um, the Director of Communications for the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, which is the um, diocese in Washington, D.C. for the Episcopal Church. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, and as well as um, for many people who... Um, seen over the past couple months is the Diocese of the National Cathedral. So a lot of my work is involved there um, as well, where George Bush was buried and John McCain as well. Um, also, my other um, role, I am Jamaican, so I have like five jobs, um, is <laughs> I am a fellow at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute. And for those who may not know, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a um, Protestant church leader and Nazi resistor who um, was um, assassinated, well, killed by um, Adolf Hitler um, because he planned an assassination plot. He felt like it was his Christian duty to um, defy empire by any means necessary um, in the 1940s. Um, so there's an institute that was formed um, in his honor. Um, he was trained here in the United States and taught here in the United States and went back to Germany um, because of what was going on with um, the Jewish people. So um, I have, before that, I was a youth pastor for 10 years and also worked as um, as in external relations in Massachusetts. Nice, nice. Really quickly, tell us a little bit about, because, um, you know, a lot of times we have people on from many different professions and backgrounds and academic settings. And so we get a good picture of how those worlds operate as far as, you know, moving up the chain and getting education. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, your education and how you got to become uh, Reverend Daryl Paul Laban. Oh, sure. Um, well, I am a third or fourth generation minister, so um, there's a little nepotism in there. Um, but beyond that, um, academically, um, I went to um, Nyack College, which is in Nyack, New York, um, and got a degree in biblical and theological studies with a concentration in um, biblical research. And then I went to um, Boston University School of Theology, where I earned my Master's of Divinity in Christian Social Ethics. Um, so that was um, most of my um, learning was done there. Nice. That's really uh, cool. So I, I've always wanted to know, I guess, what what was like the driving passion? I know you said it's kind of something that, you know, has been passed down in your family. But, you know, as a young uh, black man or, or younger black man of this generation, I guess what motivated you or, or sparked your interest in, you know, pursuing uh, a career, uh, a life in, you know, teaching, administering? Um, sure. Um, well, I think some will say, um, if, to give a spiritual um, response, the first response will say that it's a call. It's something I felt ever since I was um, seven years old um, that I really felt called to do ministry at that age. Um, and as I grow older, I started refining that call and um, at many times question that call. Um, later on, um, I really felt like um, being a minister and um, getting that theological training it's just so influential in how the world works um, in terms of how politics um, is understood. It's because of theology and religion and the influence that religion has played over the past 
five, 10,000 years. Um, so it, academically, it's just, it was just always an interest for me. Um, and also, I believe that many of the um, social movements of our generation on either side of the aisle comes out of a theological and um, worldview, um, religious background. Before we did a podcast episode on with Dr. William Hart, who talked about the black community and black religion um, and and I guess the relation between the two. And so we may I made sure to kind of re-listen to that episode before we had the discussion having Daryl on, uh, because, again, this is part of his expertise and maybe he has some different perspectives. So so there I guess we could just start the conversation from what did you think of that interview and, and, and what are your thoughts on it overall? What, you, what were some takeaways? Um, well, I thought it was a very good interview. Um, he's definitely well learned in um, the history of the black church religion. Um, I, I think the one area that I really had um, a point of disagreement with was, um, and it's common in many different um, many different retellings of the story. And that is really around the role of the black church in the civil rights movement. I mean, I think there's this myth and there's this narrative um, that we all play into that says that the church was the meeting spot. The church was the um, one of the primary places for um, the social civil rights movement. Um, and I kind of want to disturb that narrative a little bit because the reality is that um, only 10% of black churches were involved in the civil rights movement. Um, actually, Dr. King um, formed his own denomination because the largest African-American Baptist denomination did not agree with him. Um, the National Baptist Convention, he formed the Progressive National Baptist Convention. Hmm. Um, I think there's just this narrative that we always think of the civil rights movement, think that everybody was out there marching and um, meeting in churches and thinking of plans. Um, when I just think that really wasn't um, truthful. Many black churches just didn't get involved at all. Um, so that was one part that I really found um it just goes with this national myth about even Dr. King. Um, he was honestly, when he was assassinated, he was one of the most hated um, men in America. His views were very revolutionary and they thought that he was, um, um, in his words, a rabble rouser. Um, so he, um, so I think now that years have gone by, um, his work is being lifted up as truly prophetic. But at the same time, he was not well loved both in and outside of his community. Um, and I think that's just one, I just think that's just one point that needs to be raised as well. You know, I think it's actually so funny. So, of course, it's Black History Month and you see everyone quoting Dr. King, this, you know, <laughs> beloved figure. But like you said, back then he was not, you know, this beloved figure, especially, um, you know, after he really started calling out people. When you think about like letters from a Birmingham jail and, and things of that nature. Uh, but, yeah, I, I thought that was interesting as well. Piggybacking off what Daryl was saying, I think that... um it, it makes sense to me, right? Because especially now that, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up in the church and mm -hmm. so I have, you know, a rigid religious background, but also I'm not in the church as much, but I'm familiar with it today. But, you know, there's some things that I've realized, right, that kind of makes sense because what, what Dr. King was doing was very progressive in a lot of ways. And I think what I'm noticing is that a lot of times people who are involved uh, with the church or religion, sometimes what I see are, are a little bit more conservative in their yeah. political viewpoints. Um, so it, it makes sense why maybe only 10 percent or why Dr. King would not be accepted uh, with many Baptists, stuff like that, because a lot of times the viewpoints like case in point there. Uh, I've talked about it before in this podcast. One of um, the pastors that I grew up with in church, you know, just just talks about how she you know, was voting for Trump and trying to get people to vote for Trump. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, could th things dealing with like his stance on abortion and stuff like that. And that, that kind of caught me off guard. I'm like, whoa, like, you know, what is going on here? Um, but, you know, looking at a broader scale, I think that's not as uncommon as I, as I thought it was. You know? Absolutely. And I think even um, now, I think um, when we think about um, like just the black church right now um, and the state that it is right now, um, given all the movements going on, um, the black church by far is pretty silent. And I think that is just how it was back in the day. I think everybody wants to be a hero now that they're, when they're older, they're like, oh yeah, I, 
I was a part of it, but the truth is that most folks just weren't a part of it. So I think, yeah. Yeah, I was actually about to say what uh, the statistic you gave, the 10 percent, it actually puts a lot of things in context now because people are like, well, where? And that was a part of the conversation with Dr. Hart, you know, kind of where is the black church in these current movements for like freedom and and black lives? And so when you put it in the context of, the, you know, that there were only like 10 percent involved, it's kind of like, OK, well, maybe the black church is where it has always been. Mm-hmm. And and at the same time, the black church has also still played a kind of prophetic role. So um, in the movement, so, you know, you have, you know, those Dr. Kings, we have the Adam Clayton Powells, we have um, the Al Sharptons of today that was really um, <clears throat> came out of the black um, uh, ministerial leadership. Um, but it is very far and few between Um and, and today, when it comes to um, CAP, certainly there are churches that have like Nike Sunday, which is, I just think is very problematic for a number of reasons. Um, but there's some churches that are participating, but by and far, it is very far and few between. Mm. You know, I have a question that, I, you know, this still came to my mind as we're talking about this. From your, from your experience, from your I guess, position in your profession where you stand. How do you feel when, you know, I know how I feel when I hear a pastor that I know or someone who is black, who's like, you know, vote for Trump or supporting Trump and stuff like that. I mean, honestly, I'm ready to like that. You know, I really don't want to hear nothing else Mm -hmm. from you past that point. I mean, that's because of my how I feel and and my stance on the issues. But I mean, you being um, a part of like religious institutions and that being your profession. And I'm sure you have your own views on that. So like what is your stance and your takeaway when when politics are involved in these kind of capacities? And sometimes when people are supporting someone like Trump against all other kind of odds and situations? Um. This is um, my view on someone that supports Trump. Um, I think um, is that the question? Well, yeah, from like a like if it's a, somebody who is a religious leader, right, coming out and like from I'm just thinking from how I feel from my perspective, right. Yeah. I'm not really in the institution. I don't work there. I would just be a member of a church, and I would hear my pastor saying this, and then you know I'd be already not have a lot of ill feelings towards that situation or that decision. Uh, but I'm saying you being in these spaces, some of these people being your colleagues and stuff like that. And I'm sure you have your own positions. Can, so I'm saying like, I guess I'm trying to say like, how do you feel about that one? But also sh- is there, should there be like a separation when now we're talking about like spiritual leaders and politics, because that, you know, for somebody like me, that may be a turnoff, right? I hear you say you support Trump. Well, I'm, I may not be coming to this church again, or I might not be accepting what you're saying anymore uh, because of how you feel or supporting this individual. So I'm just trying to get your thoughts on it. Um, sure. Um, well, um, I think as a religious leader, if I, as for pastors, um, I think it is a little unethical to support either party. Um, Mm -hmm. either Republican or Democrat, whether it's Trump or Obama um, or whoever the next person will be. Um, I'm not so certain I am. um, One of my favorite um, scriptures um, is taken from the book of Joshua, where Joshua, there's an angel stands up before Joshua and says, Joshua, um, um, Joshua asks the angel rather, are you for them or are you for us? And the angel says, neither, I'm on the Lord's side. Um, And I think that is the position, the posture that most pastors should play. Like, I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, um, or I'm on kind of on God's side, knowing that thinking in those kind of terms. For me, it is a turnoff if either party, if if anybody's the supporting openly. I'm not saying not to vote or anything like that. I certainly vote and think everyone should vote. But I think as a pastor, um, you should be more, um, a little more uh, reserved when it comes to declaring your preference in a person, because that is just not, I think it can be a little abusive Mm. in a lot of ways. Um, and it's just a conflict. This, I think it's unethical, honestly, to stand in your pulpit and either tell your members who you're voting for or encourage them to vote in a particular way. Mm. Um, I think when it comes to policies, certainly we can be on top of policies because policies by and large do not have necessarily a particular political orientation to it at face value, at least. Um, but I think when it comes to a person, I think we, I think that, or a party, um, I think both parties are equally 
sinful. <laughs> um, so that's quite, I think, yeah, both are equally <laughs> sinful. Yeah. Uh, just in different ways and it exposes in different ways, but they're both equally sinful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was actually about to ask you because when you were like, oh, you know, not necessarily uh, speaking up about a party. Um, but one of my ish, I guess, I guess I guess I do see like an issue with what I've seen, like some evangelical pastors like coming out, you know, saying things like, you know, Trump was God sent and, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. I, it feels uh, it makes me feel icky because it's like, OK, I'm a Christian and. I don't feel like this is my religion. Um, But at the same time, you do want to hear, you know, your uh, religious leaders saying this is right or, you know, this is not right. Uh, So you in in some ways you want to see them take a stance, but not necessarily, I guess, use God as a um, tool to say this is what you should be doing. Absolutely. Um, I think there. So, I mean, if we look at Trump, we could say like what's happened at the border is unethical, you know, um, but I think we could also say the same thing about Obama and say that his drone strikes um, was unethical as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the problem comes becomes when um, we just kind of have this Jerry Falwell moment, like what Jerry Falwell said from Liberty University, that um, there's nothing that Trump can do that that um, will make him lose the evangelical vote. I think that is problematic. Um, as well as I think anybody that says there's nothing that Obama could have done that would have taken away the vote. I think that's problematic. I think the role of the church, one of the roles is um, priestly, but the other one is prophetic, which is to call, um, speak truth to power, no matter who is in office, whether they are Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Tea Party. The role of the church is to be um, kind of sit on the margin and speak truth to those who are in power to say, um, I'm on the Lord's side. (laughs) Um, I'm not on your side. I'm just here trying to push the kingdom of God forward. So, and I think we just get in trouble when we lay in bed with any, either political party. Um, we just find ourselves in a very compromised position. So I guess speaking of uh, like politics, there's a lot going on and we don't expect you to take a stance, you know, on any particular uh person. Uh, but I guess what are some of the issues that you think people, you know, should care about and, and should think about as we are thinking about electing a, another official in 2020? Um, well, for me, um, I can tell you what my thoughts are, uh, my top um, ideas. Um, one would be around economic justice. I mean, and I think I'm just talking a little more personal more than anything when it comes to student loans and and things of that nature. Um, Mm -hmm. I I just think that um, we need to have a conversation that somebody needs to be talking about the economic justice for the middle class. Um, And um, I think that's my personal view. Um, But I think this, the role that um, the ethical, the ethics rather of, of, our banking system, the ethics around um, student loan providers, just economic justice on a whole, on poverty. Um, I think that should be um, a top concern for um, for Christians um, by far. Um, I don't necessarily get into the abortion um, generally just because um, I think that is just um, too highly politicized to be of any good there. Um, but I think um, we need to be talking about um, gun control. I think that is a huge um, consideration for um, those who are um, who want a more Christian world, possess a more Christian worldview. Um, I think those are my top two. I could be forgetting a couple, but those are the top two that's on my mind most of the time, really around economic justice and um and violence and um, gun control. Hmm. You know, th- those sound good. And yeah, I know the, yeah, the abortion arc, that, that thing is always, <laughs> um, yeah, very politicized and always a, a mess when it gets into certain debates, um, which I always find interesting, but yeah, we're definitely not going to touch on that today. Sure. Uh, but as far as I guess, and this dab, this is open to you too. I mean, uh, I know we had a brief conversation about 
the kind of 2020 candidates on, on the Democratic side, because right now, you know, Trump is going to be uh, for for Republicans. Um, but is, has there been any updates, anything you've noticed? I mean, I know Bernie Sanders has announced um, that he is throwing his hat again in the race, which, again, has sparked some conversation. And they're saying now he's the front runner and people are wondering what's his effect going to be around this time, this time around. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on the current situation we're seeing with the Democratic Party? Um, well, I, I just have to say, um, I feel like, you know, just thinking about the last run, the 2016 election, there were a lot of emotions and a lot of like divisiveness that came uh, when that happened around like Bernie's not winning the nomination. Mm-hmm. And so it scares me. Because it's like, I don't want that to happen again. Um, primaries happen for a reason. You know, a particular party, they vote They vote on the person that they want to, you know, be in the, the actual presidential election. And if people have their feelings hurt, if their candidate doesn't win, I don't want it to be another... Um, just replay of the 2016 election to where we can't rally around a candidate that could beat Trump. And another thing, Bernie Sanders is old. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, I, to be honest, yeah. I'm ready I mean, for I mean, the hey. torch to be passed to our generation. You know, I'm, I'm sick of seeing the same type of leaders in in office, if I'm I'm being honest, I do like his platform. I can say that, but it it comes with potentially a lot of baggage or damage if people who are his supporters don't get their way, and it's just kind of like that leads the way for another Trump term. That's just my feelings. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think you know you do uh, have some points and. Right now, I honestly don't feel, I mean, it's very early, but the same kind of, um, I guess, support or maybe energy that Bernie bought the last time around, I'm not sure if I'm feeling it right now. Um, and I don't think he's, I don't feel like he's as like that in that same energy yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe because, you know, I think, and I, I largely just think because of the, the, I think a lot of people who are in the race now kind of took from his blueprint a little bit and adopting some of that, that progressive lingo mm-hmm. and are putting in their platform. So it kind of like evens it out where like last time he was like the clear, like one of the only ones really preaching that kind of stuff. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know if this time around it'll be the same for Bernie as it was last time. Yeah, I, I, I think I think the dem- what the Democrats really have to really focus on is electability. Um, yeah. And I'm not certain. Also, Bernie is electable. I don't know how well he will appeal to um, to rural voters. I'm not certain um, he's for most of his career. He's played like this ultra progressive kind of vibe. Um, so I'm not too. I think someone that's more electable and maybe I'm showing my hand a little bit right now. Um, he's also old as. Bernie, um, that's Joe Biden. Um, um, but um, I think Biden is probably more electable in terms of has enough um, cred with both rural voters and also some of the progressives. Well, some of the progressives. Um, but I'm, I'm more excited about a Biden run more than a Bernie run. Um, but that's just actually a Biden Harris run will make my day. I'll just I'll just stop campaigning <laughs> right now. I'll just stop. Yeah, so everybody's still waiting for Biden to throw his hand in the yeah, yeah. race. In the hat, hand yeah. in the, the race. Um, but that would, you know, we've talked about that before. You know, I think Biden would be, just looking at it, probably the best matchup against someone like Trump. Yeah. Um, for like the reasons you said, also just personality-wise, 
Um, Cause I think to go toe to toe with Trump, you know, Trump played that kind of getting the dirt, getting the mud game. And mm-hmm. it was hard for anybody else to do that. Well, we know Biden to already have those kind of characteristics <laughs> and it'd be acceptable. So it wouldn't hurt him as if it were to hurt like a Kamala Harris trying to do that. Or Absolutely. Cory Book or Elizabeth Warren. It just wouldn't look the same. So, you know, I, I can see I, I think I can see that with with Biden being in there, that might be one of the strongest shots to definitely make sure we get this guy out of office. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that really has to be the goal. Like who, like I think anybody would be better than Trump. I think anybody on the slate right now who has announced would be better than Trump. But it's really about who could get us elected, who could be, who we could be certain who could get him out. I mean, do you guys, and I'm going to ask y'all this and it might be hard to answer. Uh, do you guys think that Trump has a, a real chance of winning again? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, because I mean, I don't think many expected for him to win the first go round, and and now um, I don't think you know. I think maybe there might be more of a pushback, or people might be ready to get him out. But I, I mean, he he, we thought he didn't have a chance last time, and he won. And so there's no way I can say that he doesn't have a chance at all this time, uh, yeah. which is still very scary, like scary to me <laughs> to be like another four years, man. Like um, that's why I think who the Democrats select. It just, it just, it's very crucial mm-hmm. when it comes down to it. And, and I think also the, for as horrible as I personally think Trump um, policies are, um, at least he's consistent about his policies and he's clear about it. Um, it was build the wall and that was basically it. Um, I think the issue that some Democrats are going to have is I think Trump does have a chance of winning because Republicans are going to, that most most of them, um, most evangelical Republicans are not going to vote for um, a Democrat. It just they will feel like it is a betrayal of their Christian values to do such a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, so I think that unless the Democrats really know can really push it, um, push their agenda forward, get out the vote, or maybe become a little bit more centrist. Um, Trump really has a good chance of winning again. Yeah. Um, speaking of centrist, um, I, I've seen that a senator from Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar, Klobuchar, how mm-hmm. you say her last name again? Yeah. Klobuchar. Klobuchar, yeah. Klobuchar, Amy Klobuchar. Um, you know, I've seen a couple op-ed pieces uh, talking about her, how she may potentially have somewhat of a Bernie effect as far as potentially maybe splitting the party in some ways, uh, largely because she is more of a centrist and she kind of classifies herself in that way. I mean, she's on the Democratic side and see as most of the people who are running right now are pretty progressive. And so she would kind of be the standout, which may stretch some of those votes who for people who may not want to be all the way to the left or completely progressive and still have some realistic ideas. And some of the things she's been saying, you know, makes sense. She's not saying that she's against any of these kind of progressive ideals and stuff, like not against things like the Green New Deal, not against um like, well, she's against like I think Medicare for all or whatever it is, but is more supportive of universal health care with kind of a, a option, a public option for states. Like, let it be state ran instead of federal ran where states can, uh, you know, create incentives or whatever to to provide health care for all their um, residents, et cetera. Uh, but her idea reading about what she's been saying, it's mainly been on the sense of, you know, I a lot of progressives are selling us this dream. Right. Not a dream, but like the end goal, if you will. Like, yeah. this is what we want at the end of the day, but not telling people that what it will take to realistically get there. And she's like, I want those things, but it's going to take steps. Like, yes, uh, maybe free four year, four year college would be great, but it's just not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. We should do free two year college first and then give more Pell grants. And then as that grows, then we can have more conversations about free four year college, et cetera. So she seems to not be, be speaking in a way that's like, she supports the end goals of progressives, but she just wants, she wants us to take the step-by-step of how to get there. And I think that's going to play very interesting too. Um, when, if she starts making higher and getting into the debates, cause right now people are saying Bernie, then it's like Amy and Kamala, I think are right behind him. And so, so as, as this, as we start to hear more conversation, more dialogue and maybe some debates, um, I want to see how people will be, how many people will kind of be drawn to that kind of perspective. 
you know, it's I feel like it's taboo to be drawn to that, like to say, like, what are the steps? I think you're just supposed to believe in like this dream. Like she says, she does believe. But I am the how is this going to happen person? Because I don't want somebody <laughs> just selling me a dream. And then when we get yeah. there, you're just like, yo, none of this actually happened. So I I love like I said, I love a lot of the platforms. They're very progressive out there. But I do want to know how it's going to happen and not just um and so, like, for instance, uh, Trump sold his voters a make America great again. And some people get caught up in that message. If if it's a message that they can, like, latch on to, that's a winning thing. But when we actually see a lot of his make America again platforms, when we see them in action, a lot of them have been challenged. He can't actually get the funding. So it's kind of like I don't want to be one of the supporters uh, or be like this Trump supporters that I judge that I talk about to say, Hey, you fell for those, you know, wild policy ideas, knowing that he did not have a way to actually achieve them. And so I don't want to be just like them. I do want to hear how candidates are going to put through their progressive agenda. Yeah. I mean, I I agree with you, but I think we just had someone that just did that. I mean, I think Hillary Clinton, I mean, she's a policy wonk. I mean, all she talked about were like very deliberate steps towards things. And she just didn't excite many people. And I, and I think that's the fact that that's missing from Amy a little bit is this kind of excitement. You know, yeah. you just don't feel, when you hear her speech, it's like, okay, she's a pragmatist. And <laughs> okay, yes, you had some good plans. But at the end of the day, Nobody really wants that from their leader. I mean, um, um, John Meacham, who's a presidential historian, talks about that the history of our country is that the presidents are kind of like kings, like inspirational kings. They're supposed to, like, in those moments of deep distress um, and uh, conflict, they come on and have this presidential kind of um, appeal and and give inspire hope to people and with Amy uh, sorry Mrs. Klobuchar um, I just don't get that same <laughs> kind of energy that you know I think you know like Obama he sold us a lot of dreams I mean mm-hmm. it was a lot of hope yeah. it was yeah. hope that was the name of his whole <laughs> thing and we were like yeah that's what we want and for Donald Trump he spoke the same kind of language to his base and to the Republicans like we're going to make America great again, which um, also something Bill Clinton ran on and Ronald Reagan ran on, you know, um, you know, but, you know, I think we need that kind of hope. Yes, the steps are cool, but you need, you need something to excite you. Yeah, it's, just, it's trying to find that, I guess, that candidate who has the, the hybrid, you know, who can both rile everybody up and be excited. But I think, you know, I, also have the steps Um, because yeah you're right I think most people are not trying to look for the fine lines and seeing what the details are and the policies and and if things are actually going to work I think majority of Americans are probably like who says the right things who speaks to me the most and I'm going to go with that person Um, and then when you get to the nitty-gritty of policy and and all that kind of stuff yeah most people are going to be turned off for not thinking that far ahead another quick thing about what I what I'm interested to see too because I'm already seeing that people are like you know say okay Bernie then Klobuchar and and then Harris but also the response between because both of both Harris and Klobuchar both are um were started their careers as prosecutors as well and she definitely was on tough on crime drug warrior increased the state's prison population dramatically her her prosecute a lot of her prosecutions affected people of color largely as well and so that's been a lot of blowback for harris as well um so it's wanted to see like how people are going to play that into the conversation and one instance is like and also me thinking too like both are terrible and I know people are going to be throwing race into there, right? So it's like, is it worse when it's a white? We kind of expect white people doing it, but is it worse when a black person is doing it to their own? Like, I wonder how people are going to feed into that narrative too, or that conversation with these critiques of these candidates. Who knows? Actually, as you were saying, like, as you were describing the two before you even said, I was like, I, to, and maybe this is, um, it's kind of like, not that I would hold the black it's not necessarily holding them to a different standard but it's just kind of like in this world in the u.s i kind of expect certain things from certain you know demographics 
Mm-hmm. And you might expect a, a different demographic to like have your like back a little bit more. And it's kind of like, I don't know, it can be a, a turn off because it's like, mm, I don't know. It's kind of a like a you should know better type thing. And I've over yeah. the last couple of weeks, I've seen uh, Senator Harris, you know, give different interviews where people have asked her about this. And I've noticed that she turns it into, you know, uh, of course, I'm going to prosecute child molesters and yes, rapists and like, all of that. And I was like, but that's not what we're asking about. We're yeah. asking you about truancy. We're asking you about your office, you know, saying that they didn't want to release nonviolent offenders because it might mess with the prison employment population. Like, we're not yeah. asking about we're like rapists and murderers. And so of course we want them locked up. Yeah. <laughs> but have you noticed that as well? Yeah, no, I've seen it. I've seen it. And I think that's one of the things that frustrates me with with somebody like Kamala. And I think, you know, she's not the only politician. Most politicians do that and they they beat around the bush and not talk about what you're trying to really talk about. But it's just like to me, what made me feel better is just say my bad. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry. Like what I did, I wasn't thinking whatever, you know, my position, et cetera. I didn't understand the impact. And just show me that you recognize what we're talking about, address it, and then try to ensure me that it won't happen again. But by the fact you keep just beating around the bush with it, it's just like, uh, it makes it harder. You know what I'm saying? It's like, come on now. We know what these policies did and how they affected our people. Just like, own up to it. We all make mistakes, so we all don't make the best decisions all the time especially when it comes to the black community. And, and so let's move forward from here. Um, but yeah, it's tough. Can, can I play devil's advocate for a second? Go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and that is because um, I think it is, um, I also think that some of the attacks that Kamala has been getting is just not fair um, mm-hmm. in terms of that we are judging her, um, her 2000, what, three and 2004 policy on 2018 um, realities. You know, it's just it's just totally different. I believe the times were different. Um, I mean, for God's sakes, I mean, even with Obama, Obama just um, I mean, before he, he, he was opposed to to gay marriage up mm-hmm. until, you know, like four years into his term. You know, so I think and we we just have this view that um, how things were back in 2004 is how is in 2018. I mean. There were certain policies. She was the district attorney, um, and that was her her role in a lot of ways. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's the same that we kind of beat up Hillary for with the super predators, and I mean, and the crime bill in the in the early um, ni- the late nineteen nineties. Uh, but I just think that I, I don't know if that argument is fair. That's all I'm trying to say. I, I'm not so certain how fair it is to judge someone on that when that was just the policy and, and the law of the land change the laws to a certain extent. Yeah. And so I th- and I think that's where Todd's point come in. Like, so I for me, I do feel like people can grow and change. So even like the Obama example, you know, that you had like, you know, his views on gay marriage. And I think a lot of politicians have been there as well, have like changed over time. And I just want somebody to say, yes, you know, maybe, you know, reflecting back on that, maybe that wasn't the, you know, the best approach, you know, at the time I was, you know, working with what, you know, I had, you know, you know, thinking about the, the error or whatever it is, but these are the ways I've changed. But for me, for you to double down. And like I said, it's not all of the things, but like as somebody who focuses on education and understand that truancy is so much more than like, your parents telling you to wake up and like you wanting to send black parents to jail because their children are true. Like that's misguided policy. So for what what I want to see is somebody to say, you know, maybe that was a little misguided. This is where my heart was. And I see how we could, you know, maybe do these things in the future. Because for me, if you're not a leader who learns and who grows, I don't want you as a leader because I feel like there's nobody that is perfect. There's nobody that's going to know it all. But if you can't say that you've ever done something wrong or you've grown in these ways, then I don't want you because you're just going to double down on all your bad mistakes in 2018 like you did in 20, 2003. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, even with like the Hillary critique, people, I think I can agree. Like, I don't think it was fair for her because a lot of it was her husband who was president. She was the first lady um, and she supported it. So it's not even like she was like an elected official uh, supporting things like super, super predator. She was just giving her perspective, which, of course, was backing her husband. Uh, but yeah, Kamala, like, again, I, even with some of her interviews, you know, I think on, even on the Breakfast Club interview, I think Charlamagne asked her, like, you know, like, how do you you know, feel, or do you have any regrets about anything you've did? And she's like, her, my only regret is like, I wish I could have did more. I was like, dang, that was the perfect opportunity for you to be like, yeah, you know, I'm, I probably should have did something differently with the truancy policy. One larger, cause it wasn't even effective. Like, cause they even highlight the fact that, oh, we didn't arrest anybody because of it, but like, okay. I mean, you can even just even admit that like, okay, maybe it was a mistake for, cause it was effective or it wasn't my intent, whatever it was. But I think that was the opening for you to, to show us like you understand and you're feeling what we're saying. But I think by just discarding or not really fully addressing it, I think that's kind of like, a, I don't know, it's, 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 it's demeaning a little bit and you're not really getting, and I feel like once you address it fully head on, then you can move past it, right? Because people are going to keep asking you and keep and keep knocking on that door until you just, until you finally give them what they want. And if not, if you're not giving them what they want or at least responding to the direct question, then it's going to be lingering that black cow lingering over her head as she progresses. And I think that's going to, it's going to hurt her. And I, and I, you know, I wrote a blog post about this not too long ago and it's like, I'm, I'm, root, I'm rooting for the black folk. Like, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm giving everybody a fair shot, but, you know, I'm not going to lie. I have my presence. Like, if I, I would like to see some black folk or some people of color up on the forefront of this and really, uh, uh, you know, taking the throne again away from Trump. And um, so it's not like I'm, but I think there's some things that I'm seeing that I'm like, OK, you know, I just want you to really just uh, just just own up to it. And let's move on. Just don't act like it never happened. But we'll see. Mm hmm. We'll and if you haven't that. checked out that blog post, you guys need to read it. Very, very informative. Very well thought out. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Check it out. Um, so any any other thoughts with, you know, any Harris, whatever. Booker. The, the Bernie Booker. Yeah. <laughs> anybody. <laughs> so many people in this field. So many. Um, I mean, uh, I, th I think Booker is doing, a, taking a little bit out of the Obama playbook with his appeal to hope. And um, like his... His um, announcement video was very, it almost seemed like futuristic almost. Um, it was just like this whole hope theme. And I mean, something he's been working on, I don't necessarily think he has a chance of winning, um, but I do appreciate his appeal to hope and his appeal to, um, to the, I guess some will say the better angels of our nature. I think he's does have some issues when it comes to, the, I think they asked him recently about his, um, about, uh, I think it was something related to um, like dealing with um, white people. And he says, we need to learn to forgive them or um, be more understanding <laughs> of where they're coming from. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 step I, in their shoes. We just, uh, uh, shoes. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. So, oh my God. So I'm not so certain how he will energize the black vote on that, but you know, to each his own. Yeah, I think. Um, I, I saw, and that's something that you mentioned, the black vote, because uh, a quick op-ed I was reading was talking about that, how Bernie really didn't do that well with the black vote uh -huh. as well. And so it's kind of like many of these candidates are like, who's going to get the black vote? Maybe the deciding factor, actually, in a lot of ways, because, um, you know, everybody's going to get the kind of progressive measure for the most part. Um, and that Bernie did that, but really didn't get the black vote because he really didn't speak to the black people. But you have all these other candidates. Um, and I really don't know yet. Yeah. And of course, you think the black people would be the front runners for that. But Kamala has been having a difficult, a difficult time. And, and Corey, you know, is not all the way up there as the other one. So we'll see. But I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fairly split. And, you know, I didn't feel like Bernie necessarily campaigned toward me because he always talks about, like, getting away from identity politics. But to me, he does play identity politics with white working class voters but that's another story uh so right now i think it would be split because like i said he does have a good policy platform and those are policies that would indeed help the black community but i don't know if there's anybody that's creating black policy you know what i'm saying yeah yeah I don't know if we'll get, but I guess kind of going back to a Dallas point, like, come on, Joe Biden. Don't you know Because <laughs> at least he's up a Joe. little bit. <laughs> at least it's Uncle Joe. He gets an a honorary ticket to the cookout. I mean, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Joe cool, man. Joe cool. I wouldn't be bad at all. At all. And I, I would like to see how it plays out, you know. 
I would love to see him debate Trump. I would oh, love to see him. I had a popcorn ready. <laughs> oh, so man. Um, all right. So any anything else on politics? Uh, you know, we got it all off our chest. Anything else? Uh, I I think I'm I think I'm good on politics. I, I kind of want to go to some uh, current events. Uh, oh, the real the real nitty gritty <laughs> stuff, huh? Yeah, huh? yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess we can seg segue um from politics just because this has like been a big part of politics in the last year. Of course, Kaepernick and his settlement mm-hmm. with yeah. the NFL. We don't know how much. Yeah, it's been a lot of debate with this whole Kaepernick thing for our listeners who may not be familiar with. I know I'm sure you're familiar with Kaepernick by now, but recently he's got a settlement with the NFL um, here, him and Reed. Uh, and, you know, we don't know how much, but I've heard estimates from like 60 million to like 120 million. So we don't know how much money that he's received. Uh, but, you know, now there's a lot of questioning. OK, the settlement happened. Now people, one, they're saying, OK, and, we, and everything is confidential. So we don't know what the settlement was fully about. What were the details? Um, all these things. But usually when there's a settlement, one can assume that, uh, you know, the NFL played some kind of a guilty role in some capacity. Um, it's usually not official admittance of, admittance of that, but it may be. And so people are now trying to figure out having questions like, OK, well, do we continue to support, you know, stand with cap and boycott the NFL? Is Cap trying to still be on a team? Many people are saying, well, now that he got hit this money, are we? is he still going to be uh, an advocate <laughs> for the cause? Um, you know, it's a lot of questions now that have come about because of the settlement. So uh, what are your thoughts on this situation? Anyone? Well, I just want to know, um, because he got this money, um, does this mean that we can watch um, football again? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> that's the, I, mean, yes. I, I, um, I would like to say that um, I think it's, um, I, I, I think I've always had um, like in the back pocket, like I, I of course stand with Cap and what he was, you know, standing for um, police um, brutality um, against rather against <laughs> police brutality. Um, but I've always wondered like, what is the line? And because at the same time with everyone protesting the NFL, he was still trying out for NFL teams at the same time. So if, so I think it was just a weird position to be in um, because there could be an argument that if he felt like the organization is racist, that he should just walk away from it all mm-hmm. and say, I don't want anything to do with it. And um, you can keep the NFL. I'm going to start my own thing um, or, you know, do be a social activist. Um, but his kind of dancing with it, because I'm sure if like if the Patriots called him and said, hey, we want to put you on the roster, he would have said yes. So I'm, I'm I was just a little conflicted. And I think I don't know how to reconcile it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, and I think that's when kind of movements take a life of their own. I'm not sure he ever called for people to boycott but it's just kind of like you know when people maybe feel connected and they feel like this is not going you know the way I think it should go you know they decide what they want to do I've never been like a football like person I've always watched things like the Super Bowl but you were never going to catch me like watching like a Sunday night football but like I did I didn't watch the the Super Bowl the last few years because it was just kind of like okay it's not something I want to support And it was partially until like there was some type of resolution to say like, okay, we acknowledge some wrongdoing. We we acknowledge um, our fault or our part in, you know, this larger issue and we want to resolve it. Um, But I I feel like I don't know my my feelings personally it's like when I feel like something has been done wrong I feel like people should be held accountable for it or organizations or whatever it is and I don't think it's something that cap called for but I think in a way the larger community just wanted to hold you know the the organization accountable in some way yeah yeah I can see that I think um yeah, um, I can see where yeah where like uh, Daryl is torn and 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 that was a good perspective. I think I think I think it's easier to look at. I guess if we just look at Cap's original message was really just to shed light on injustices that go on in this country, not really to shed light on the NFL. Um, it turned 
into that because of how the NFL treated Cap. And then people got upset at the NFL, like, oh, why are you, you know, doing all this? Or why are you firing her? Why are you creating all these rules about kneeling, et cetera, uh, retroactively uh, when he's shedding light on something that's really real to a lot of people? Um, so I think if we look at it from that lens, then I think it's okay that Cap continues because, you know, that's his passion. That's his gift, his football. And so while he would still want to do that, he was treated unfairly uh, within that system because he stood up for injustices. But the message has always been about the broader societal injustices more than it's been about football. Um, and so I think more importantly to me, whether or not it's not about if he plays or not anymore. I think if he, even if he does play, I think I'm fine with that. But I want to see if he keeps that same energy now, right? That he's got the settlement. He's on a team. When the anthem comes on, will, will he continue to kneel, right? Will we see that? Or will we see him still be outspoken about these issues? I think that's what's going to be a little bit more important to me um, moving forward, watching Cap and his movements from this period forward. So I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be like a real recognized, real situation. <laughs> yeah. Cap, real yeah. recognized, real Cap. <laughs> a real recognized, real Cap and Nick. So, so it's interesting, man. Uh, but also, and another point too, is with the NFL period, compared to like other leagues, like the MLB and the NBA and everything else, even listening to other NFL players on interviews, being asked about, you know, the protest, the boycott, and a lot of them don't, like uh, participated in themselves, like want to make change for themselves, even though it's a system that's largely corrupt, they get exploited more than other professional athletes, but they're living in a system. And when other like the ML, when it was happened to the MLB, when it was happened to the NBA, you know, they boycotted, they sat out, you know, they had short seasons. They wasn't playing until they got contracts that were favorable to them, which gave them guaranteed money. And NFL players, for some reason, do not, do that, you know, um, as other professors. So part of it is also on them. If they want to see the change, they're going to actually fight within and be like, all right, I'm sitting, I'm not playing, I'm boycotting, you know, uh, as a collective. And then they'll get better contracts and better health care and all this other stuff and be able to have freedom of speech. Um, so part of it is like most of these cats are not even fighting for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think a lot of it is because if they do, I mean, they can just get cut any day, um, yeah. any moment. So, yeah. Mm hmm. And I was finding it interesting that none of the like rarely any white athletes, white white players or like football players ever say anything or mm -hmm. quarterbacks. I feel like if a Tom Brady says something like, you know, I'm with Cap, it would have profound impacts. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like uh, I'm with. I mean, I don't think Tom Brady would ever say that. <laughs> but if he did, think about the impact. Ain't nobody gonna tell Tom he can't play or not sit or we ain't wearing your jersey or we don't want to win. Like somebody like that is, is like different. Like when LeBron was doing it with the NBA. Yeah. To some people in the league, you just can't tell anything to. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Okay. So moving on um, to like social media, because Cap's movement, you know, it really, you know, pushed forward through like the social media networks. And there's been another like social media movement or there was in the last couple of weeks uh, around, you know, hate, hate speech, hate crimes, like violence. And it, it happened around the Jesse Smollett case. <laughs> yeah. And the same way we rallied around Cap, we rallied around Jesse Smollett. Well, <laughs> the latest, he's been indicted <laughs> for, you know, filing like false reports and. Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. Oh, goodness. Hey, can can y'all believe? So. I read somewhere that he actually paid them with a check. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what do you guys think about? Because I've seen, you know, a lot of things on both sides. Like, yes, he should help be held accountable. But I've also seen some arguments like, you know, Pat, Patty with the cell phone and all these people that make false reports on black people, you know, they they walk away free. So I guess what do y'all think about him like being indicted and everything? Well, I think um, Patty on the cell phone and Jesse and his news are just two different things. I, mean, <laughs> I just think they're just totally different because Patty was not on Good Morning America crying his eyes out um, about what was happening to him and how, you know, people need to believe him and all that. I just think Jesse is just 
Yeah, I just think I don't even believe in cancel culture. Like I'm totally against it. But I think Jesse needs to be canceled for this. <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah, you know, this this whole story has been ridiculous. Uh I mean, you know, I think there was a sense when it first happened. I was like, oh, damn, you know, that's that's crazy. Like, they really did that. Like, news, MAGA hats, everything. Um, and then, you know, I just started listening to some other podcasts. I mentioned before, other than they were like, some people were like skeptical. Like, oh, all the, all the dots are not connected. And there was like a lot of blowback to those people. Like, what you mean? Like, how you blaming the victim? Mm-hmm. And then he went on, you know, Good Morning America, like you said, did that whole... I mean, I guess he is an actor, so, you know, it's probably second nature to him. And did that whole spiel and, and again, had people feeling for him. And then, you know, what's interesting enough is that it, the police broke this story after, right after, like the next day, or maybe even within a few hours after that Good Morning America thing. And so it was kind of like, yeah, we were waiting. You know, sometimes I think they may be careful with celebrities and dealings with certain things, but he kind of was like, oh, nobody's believing me or nothing's happening. And the police was like, oh, really? Okay, here, here you go. <laughs> here, here's what we have, everyone. <laughs> I think he shouldn't attempt to fate uh, in terms of like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Because he is like, you can't push for a police investigation when you framed it. You get what I'm saying? That's like, did he just think, okay, these guys will never get caught. There's no way that people could ever find them. Um, But also, so I'm one of those people, when I'm skeptical skeptical about something, I just keep my mouth closed. Mm -hmm. Because I ain't nobody about to like come at me like you victim blaming you. I'm just going to keep my mouth closed. Because I'll be honest, when I saw the picture of his face after the attack, I'm like, oh, he got one little scratch under his eye. It didn't look like somebody that had been like really like brutalized. Like we've seen like celebs who have, you know, gotten into incidents who have, you know, gotten into these fights and it's very clear. So I was just like, "Mm," you know, they really spared his face. That's all I was thinking. But I was just like, I I ain't going to say nothing publicly. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going (laughs) to listen and watch. And, you know, all of this happened. I, I just, oh, it's so unfortunate. It's like, what what could have been going through his mind to, what could possess him to do this? I just, I don't understand. I think he needs some help. People say he wanted, they saying that the police believe it's because he wanted a salary increase. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just can't ask for a raise, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Is that too much to ask, man? Oh, that's that's crazy, yo. You could have no. found other ways to get people rallied around you. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. But I, think, I think that's that's just what our culture is all about these days. You know, everybody wants to be famous. Everyone wants to be, you know, known for something. Everyone wants to be like Cap. Everyone wants to, instead of just being themselves, you know, and um, he, I think he said he's the gay Tupac. I think that was, that was yeah, Oh my God, I that. saw that. I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man. You know, so I think he's just playing He's a product of our culture, I think, on some levels. Um, he wants that kind of notoriety. Mm-hmm. And apparently Empire just pretty much took him out of like most of the episodes, if not all of them. Yeah. Um, they reshot some sh- some scenes. Um, so so now it's like, I'm probably going to be tuning in now just to see that. <laughs> the ratings might go up a little bit for the latter, the latter half of the season. Like you literally ended up getting the opposite of what you were trying to do. Now you're being taken out. Oh, my God. Yeah, and, and the- I heard there's like federal, potentially federal charges, too, because I think he sent the note to yeah. Fox or whatever. And when you do things like that, I think because it's due to the, uh, the mail, the mail, it's like could become a federal offense. Mm-hmm. The crazy thing is one of the people that uh, he staged the attack with had actually been on Empire. Yeah, it was like an yeah. extra, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild, man. And and all I'm saying is like, I've seen those two guys, like they've been showing the same picture of them on from their Instagram. Like they're like really buffed guys. Like, yeah. If they really beat, beat him up, he would not just have like that little. That's true. Under That's his true. Eye. You know, <laughs> I mean, it would be really, really serious. So, I mean, I'm, I know still allegedly that, I mean, they still have to prove it in court, I guess, but I think 
I think Jesse's lying. <laughs> that's my that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Somebody said he deserves a, a Emmy for his performance. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like Robin knew he was lying. You could see it in her face. She just wasn't buying it at all as he was talking. Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, a lot of people didn't, but um, and clearly those people who were skeptic were correct. They followed followed their gut because this guy. But you know, I think what's also the deeper issue and more upsetting is that you know he played victim to like a serious issue, you know, that people really go through, and and this is what a lot of people who um, oppose these kind of viewpoints or these ish situations are now can point to like uh, Jesse. And be like, well, this might be another Jesse. You see what happened with Jesse. We don't know if this is real. We don't know if this actually happened when real cases actually happen. Like he's giving people that ammunition now to to use that rhetoric against it, which is going to suck. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I, mean, I think as soon as it broke on Saturday, um, Donald Trump Jr. did a post. Yeah, um, he did. And yesterday, Donald Trump um did a post as well about it. So this is exactly, um, so going back to our political conversation, if, if Trump wins again, you could blame it on Jesse too. You could just throw that. (laughs) (laughs) Jesse, man, you're giving him and and that's what they said. It's like, you can't believe the media because they said MAGA in the beginning and they're not saying it now. Where's it all now when it's all fake? Where are you at? Yeah. I'm like, Oh, here we go, man. Thank you, Jesse, for making it even harder. Dummy, man. (laughs) Dummy. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. But no, nah, this is um, any other topics you want to talk about? Anything else on the docket before we head off? Um, I've seen that, it, you know, this whole Tristan Thompson drama again oh, has occurred. Yeah. <laughs> Him and the Kardashian clan. Spe- speaking of fake news, some people are saying that that's all fake and that it's just a publicity stunt because the keeping up with the Kardashians you is about know to what? Come back That on. might be, that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that past them, man, because they are, they are sick and twisted like that. <laughs> Another group of folk who do anything for some attention but don't have no talents. That's what makes me mad about them. I'd be like, what what do they do? Like, what's your job? Yo, it's so funny. Every time they come up on BHD, we kind of go in. Oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> anger in your voice <laughs> yeah man I just can't I just this is, that that family man is just something else man and, I mean because they culture vultures too you know they just feed off of black culture and profit so much off it. I just I just got a lot to say against them <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah we gonna end this on a positive we gonna end this on a positive we cannot end with uh, them um, I, I saw like um, you know the Jay Z kind of stepping up um, helping out with like different uh, people in the the rap community with their like legal issues, tax issues. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really important for a lot of reasons because I think you know I think we have multiple. When we talk about like black folks for money, and I think this is one of the first times we're really truly seeing black folks generating like real generational wealth. It's kind of one of the first times like we have this I guess conglomerate of folk from entertainers to whomever, and so. You know, we had there was a debate with like Steve Harvey and Monique going on, you know, and Steve Harvey was kind of saying like, yo, I got to get this money, you know, no matter whatever happens, whether it's my integrity or my pride, I got to get this money regardless. (laughs) And then and then it's so but then it's good to see people like Jay-Z who still keep that integrity, get the money and use it for the community. Right. Like the legal fees for Meek Mill, the taxes for Lil Wayne, uh, the legal team for 21 Savage being caught up with the whole integration thing. And so it's like. That is, uh, I just really, that's really admirable to me. Um, and I think this is what we should see, hopefully start to see more of and other people with wealth keep doing things along those lines. I, I completely agree. And I, I feel like, you know, talking about the the positive in our community, you know, building our community up. I think that's a good way to end this episode. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we get, okay, you know what? We got the Reverend on. Let's end this episode with a prayer. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. You know, as a Reverend, I don't like to pray all the time, Lord. So. <laughs> okay. Well, if you don't want to, man, that's cool. No, I'll, I'll do it. It's fine. Um, right. um, well, God, we thank you for um, for this podcast. Thank you for um, the days that. Um, You have given us um, life and breath on this earth. Um, I pray that you will make us um, hungry for righteousness and for justice in this world. 
I pray that you would um, give us the courage to speak truth to power, give us the faith to believe even in those moments where we're um, void of all hope. Um, give us um, the faith and the perseverance and the patience um, in this long struggle for justice that could only come from you. In the name of your son, amen. 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 Appreciate that. All right, Dad, we appreciate you having all, being all with us, man. And it was a great conversation. Appreciate the prayer, too. Thank you. Thank you. I, I enjoyed being on this, having this conversation with you as well. Yeah, we definitely enjoyed you. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.